Okay, great. We are recording. Uh, welcome to the Helia Working Group for uh, 2024, March 7th. Uh, happy birthday, wife. Um, <laughs> his birthday's happy all in birthday. a row. <laughs> happy birthday. Um, yeah, so we, we uh, have been discussing... Um, a DNS um, resolving, like globalizing that config before we started recording just a few minutes. I think um, we may, I think we kind of agreed that like moving DNS resolution up to the Helia config makes sense. But um, the issue for that uh, was somewhere over here. So I just wanted to re recap that for the recording. So yeah, we um, we should probably denote our decision here and we can do that later cool so as always um the agenda is here in notion i'll share it in the chat and actually i'm not sharing my screen <laughs> sorry sorry guys on the recording um yeah let me share my screen ba -ba -ba. desktop three Cool. Yeah. So we have our uh, working group notes in Notion. The issue for the DNS resolvers is IPFS slash Helia verified fetch pool 13, and then links to sort of a comment um, when we merge those changes. Um, yeah, we've got an epic for some of our work going with Helia Service Worker Gateway. So I plan on us just making sure that priority makes sense. We kind of synced earlier this week a, a subset of us and chatted about like, if those all make sense. So we can go over that here today. Um, where's my people view? There we go. Um, yeah, there's some percent encoding file names to fail. Other things are, if there's any other agenda items, go ahead and add them. I'll, I'll uh, add the people here now. And Adeen, sweet. Uh, yeah, um, I should also talk about, I'm going to add, um, range requests. And, uh, I had a question about the, the DNS resolvers also, which is about, um, <laughs> limiting them to just the, just the TLDs or such that they're actually needed for. Yeah. Yeah, do you want to just chat about that that r right now? Yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> I guess briefly, and I can I can paste like the Kubo version of this. But um, if we add in a a DNS resolver that just does things for say like you know ENS or you know dot ETH or dot crypto or whatever, um, we shouldn't just run all the things in parallel right sort of my my guess here right like you don't want to be hitting the i can like the google i can tld just because you got like a dot eth request um because we only have so many http requests to go around in the browser so basically uh, making dns resolvers specific to tld yeah basically one per tld no, you would, so what you'd probably do is you'd allow having like fallback resolvers. Uh, yeah. Okay. Lytle has posted the thing I was okay. looking for. Yeah. That's like, right. that's probably the best way to do this. Um, or the easiest way, at least to start. Um, if we needed a special syntax for like all I can, we could do that as well. Um, as opposed to hero where it's just like, there's a fallback resolver. Um, the dot the is thing the that, fallback that is, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, Lytle has flagged the other one, which we talked about in um in Kubo. The thing that's like a little different in, in Kubo land is that um the, the need for like a special, especially configured ICANN TLD is like less strong because you just have the DNS of your local machine, right? Whereas in, a brow in, in the browser, that's not really true. Um, because 
you know, you can't make the, you can't ask your local machine to do the DNS resolution for you to, for TXT records, All right? You have to like call a DOH endpoint. Um, um, yeah, so this seems like it's probably not like that, uh, that much of a thing to do, but I just wanted to make sure that if we were on the same page or if there were questions about this or, you know, that there's a you know better way to do it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe we, I feel like we need to like narrow in on the discussion there a bit. So maybe we can discuss I mean, that a you bit could later. just... I think it's just like you could just take the same JSON thing and pass that in as the object in Helia rather than an array. You just pass you pass in Lestruct, and that should do the job. Seems fair enough. Yeah. So this is just specifying the order of the DNS resolvers. Uh, not this, not necessarily the order, although we could do that, but it's more like the scope of them. Oh, okay, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah a little, I mean, it's a little bit of both, or something. Yeah, 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 exactly. Cool. Um, cool, cool, cool. And or I, like these. Yeah, yeah, maybe related to that, I had one, uh, maybe small question about the Helia service worker stuff, which is, um. Are we doing like duplicate loading of the data of of like the JavaScript per every time we go to a subdomain? Like are we reloading that from the endpoint? The gateway? Yeah. Currently, yes. Yeah, there's a tracking issue for that. And okay. um, yeah, we're gonna get into that. That's the caching. Um, it's mentioned in this epic. Uh, what do you mean by awesome. duplicate though? Like every time you load it? Yeah, I wanna like Every time I go to a new subdomain, I shouldn't be reloading all of the Helia code, right? Because it should be cached, because it should be the same as the... Mm, uh, it has to be. Possible. It's a it's a unique origin. You cannot walk yeah. around that. I, I mean, mean, can you can you work around it by hosting, like, making the wrapper code really small and then importing the code from elsewhere? From, from the root domain? Yeah. Maybe. I mean, yeah, maybe there might the answer be... is it's not worth doing that, and we should just figure out how to do subdomains in the browser instead, because subdomains in the browser means that you're not subject to, you'll be much less likely to get hit with like a takedown notice, because like there's nothing you can do about it. So, okay. like, uh, the load. So yes, there is a slowdown in the in that uh, when you visit a new website, you effectively will end up on a new subdomain, and that subdomain has no service worker registered yet. So the very first time you visit each route, you will initialize a service worker for that origin. Uh, there are like various ways we can make speed that up. Um, but I don't yeah. see a way for us of doing that client side only. There's no way to do that clean mapping of unique origins. Uh, yeah, there's, I mean, there might be some, some weird like um, caching things that we can do to, to improve like the loading of the assets. Um, I but, was thinking of things like, yeah. you know, if, if we do stuff, like my, my suspicion is if we end up including heavier things like allowing the ENS resolvers to use like clients, like that's going to be a heavier bundle, right? Which we can do like dynamic loading of the bundle for, but like loading that every time anyone goes to a .eth website would be sad. Um. You know, and of course we'd we'd push on the light client people to make their bundle smaller and whatever, but like um we'll likely end up in a position where like 
reloading the bundle for every web page is is a pain. Yeah, but that, that right, like it's not sustainable to load thirty two megabytes on every website you visit before you actually load any byte of that website. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I think we are on the same page. It's kind of like, but that's a matter of like optimization and yes, yeah, we have like yeah. long list of them to to do. Yeah, yeah, we can we can get at that at some point. Um, think I mean I think just having the uh, a browser version of IPFS gateway and like finishing finishing up all the yeah yeah this is more different important. edge cases yeah this will be this like once we get this working we can focus on the actual delivery of the assets that make all these things happen um but yeah it's it's I mean it'd be important to call that out here in optimizations oh. <laughs> excuse me sorry. Okay. Um yeah, trailing um Unix FS delivery is missing. So yeah, Lytle posted an update here that um uh yeah, redirecting to the IPFS or to the HTTP URL so that the browser can handle the the redirect itself. Um yeah, I think we need to like decide on how we want this to work. Uh, well, there's just like only way one way of making it work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Return HTTP URL that browser understands. Like we are, we are not able to work around that. So it's effectively adding support for HTTP things to verify fetch. Um, yeah, and and that's the thing, uh, more or less. What uh, Alex? Yeah. yeah. Um. I mean, if if it's in the service worker context, it is handling these cases, right? But are we? I think we're doing this in the service worker gateway right now yeah so verified fetch so so right now we are passing a native ipfs colon slash slash or ipns colon slash slash and we get mm -hmm. back a location header with the same protocol scheme um, yeah. so the, uh, by the, the way can't the location header be just relative It, yeah, it can be, but if we're doing to like subdomain, I don't think you can walk up directories and URLs. Yeah, it can be uh, it can be relative if we support HTTP uh, inputs. If I get HTTP input and I know I'm on a subdomain gateway, I can then return the relative one. Um, so I guess like the, the one question is, do, do we, should we like mix them? I'd say no. If the input was IPFS, you return IPFS. If the input was HTTP, you return HTTP. Kind of like you keep the same protocol scheme. That would be my suggestion. Because that that's like if we do that, we don't we we solve the service worker needs because we pass HTTP and we return either absolute or relative redirect. That works with HTTP context, and that's it. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Um, so, so then there's not further action here because I think we're we're doing that currently, right? I don't know if we support yeah. HTTP inputs. Do we? Yeah, yeah, we, we support do, yeah. HTTP yes, inputs now. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't think we need if if that works, okay. we don't need any additional thing. I I can reply on that, or or you can reply. Yeah. Uh, uh, um. Is that a recent change? It was, yeah, it was last week. Okay, yeah, moving on. Um, 
Okay, so parent uh, percent encoding. Um, duh, duh, duh. Yeah. Oh, I'm not running local host. Okay, yeah. Boop, boop, boop. Yeah, so we need to just decode those those inputs. Pretty pretty self explanatory, I think. Yeah. Okay. Uh for the epic, has everybody seen this? And are there are there any questions on uh the minimal feature set or or optimizations besides the um, the like delivery of the assets that Adin just brought up is the the issue you just like the trailing for Unix FS, um, and then the one underneath it. You said is the one underneath it done? No, like if you go back to the epic percent. Okay, if you go back to the epic. Uh, Support HTTPS gateway URLs is that we were saying that's that's done now. Uh, we are lacking a release. If it was added, it was not released yet. Okay. Cool. Yeah, it's released in. Well, it was released in one one and one dot three. Uh, one dot three is not on npm. One three is the um is the interrupt tests. Okay. Yeah. Sweet. One oh, yeah. is before I finish. Got it. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So this issue is is done. This one. Yep. Cool. Oh yeah. So yeah, I think this is a Helios service worker gateway one. So this one will be resolved once we. Mobile you know, dependencies. Get... Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Um. Yeah, anything I think support direct HTTP retrieval. Oh, yeah, sweet. I'd say this is uh, uh, nice to have after we have uh, basic correctness done. Yeah, I this think. is just this is moving, this is like one step and moving towards downloading from. You know the people who have the data instead of a proxy. dynamic, yeah, the dynamic so, um, delegated the providers that are returned like piping yeah. that through trustless gateways. Yep. Got yeah, it. so that'll happen later, and we'll want to do the same with other protocols too. But yeah, I don't think this this isn't like this definitely doesn't need to be in the minimal feature set thing. Sweet. Yeah, yeah, that one was down below. So yeah, we've got the HTTP byte range request support, um, and I've got that NPR. I've got like um, the different portions. I kind of moved my first implementation over to uh, a class that kind of keeps awareness of the file size, like when we get it, because we get it in different cases. And then the original requested byte range and things like that, and just making it testable. Um, all of the, like, I've got a circular buffer that will like may, I mean, this is something we should probably discuss here on how we want to handle, um, uh, byte requests for streams, which, um, like specifically for the, for fetching DAG PB inside of Helium verified fetch, we convert the async iterator of the, the, you know, cat method into a stream and then that was our response so that the browser could like pull on that stream as necessary. And like, um, um, we didn't have to wait on the response to return until it was done. Like it would work just like a regular, you know, asynchronous HTTP response. Um, and so I didn't want to change that, um, and like just consume the entire stream in memory, um, for many reasons. And, uh, so I created a circular buffer inside of the um, handling when a, the body is a stream. Is this not where my 
where am I at? Oh, here we go. Um, I don't think I pushed that code up yet, but basically like I, I use a transform stream when the body is a stream to only enqueue the bytes on the readable side of the transform stream to the bytes that were requested. Um, and I use a circular buffer to do that so that it's not like consuming more memory than necessary. Um, I don't know if anybody has any deep ideas about that. It's pretty, I mean, without awareness of the code, it might not be useful to discuss it, but just as a general sense, that's, that's the plan. Does the Helia cat that returns the, async that returns iterator. the async iterator, not already like pre-slice out the data that you need because you can pass in offset and length? It definitely pre-slices the data. Yeah. Like it doesn't walk bits of a tree that it doesn't have to. Like you shouldn't need to do any of this. You just need to pass in offset and length and that's it. Okay. Yeah, so I should be able to just pipe the stream through. Um, yeah, it should just be the requested yeah. parts. Okay. Sweet. Well, that was a lot of work I didn't need to do. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Actually, I guess I had a... If we're done with this one, I have another, speaking of a lot of work we didn't need to do, related question, um, which was uh, when we refactored the, um, when we refactored the resolve method to use walk path instead of the custom code, we, we chained, like the error types got changed. And I don't know if that matters or not. So I wanted to understand kind of like the, how important the error types were in within the Helia code base. Um, also, I can I can find the PR that got closed with this, but yeah, the codes. Some of the codes changed, which is, I mean, technically, it should probably be a breaking change technically, but. Like the API didn't change. It's not like Java where you can like say the kind of exceptions you're gonna throw. Um I felt a little dirty doing it, but Yeah, yeah. I think this is more like I, I remember when I was looking at it with Russell, I was like, I can change it and it's technically a breakage, but I don't know enough to know if anyone cares that this has happened. Um so I was trying to like get a get like a <laughs> get like a sense of like um whether there's like oh, a bunch of error issues. type checking going on or whether the errors are mostly like informative well the, i mean yeah so the, the idea of having the code on there is so that we can do things like change the error message to become more descriptive or maybe we'll internationalize it one day or something like that and the the uh the error code should be static at all times so that you can depend on them okay and then I just broke that contract. Um, I feel bad, but no one's opened an issue yet. And we can delete this section of the video so no one will ever know. No one will ever know. Okay, cool. Thanks. So, okay. <clears throat> Not sure I followed all of that. Um, there was a, a PR that change to Unix, F Unix FS exporter. Not to, not to Unix FS exporter, but to the to the Helia module that uses it for resolution, right? So we, we had like a couple versions of it uh, and they were more complicated than the one that that um, Alex ended up doing in merging because we were trying to keep all the error types the same. And Alex was like, can we just do the simple thing that's like two lines of code? Oh, uh, yeah. And that sounds good because it's just like less stuff to maintain, but uh, the error types changed. So I just wanted to like understand what was going on there. That was all. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. I remember that PR now. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Um, okay. So we kind of discussed before everybody that's on a call now is on the call, but the move DNS resolvers, I don't, I don't think 
um, we fully went through here. Is there anything before I move on? Is there anything else in the epic we want to discuss? I mean, here's the full list that do people agree with these? I added 91. Um, since we're already discussing it, do you want to like briefly go over that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. And that's, yeah, I have that on here. Cool. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> we added a, a configuration page to the Helios Service Worker Gateway, which was kind of like a uh, stretch goal, not really, you know, minimal use case, I don't think to begin with, but it definitely helped with debugging and stuff by setting your own gateway so that you could like pre-cache content and load it more quickly rather than like querying um, the centralized gateways and other trustless gateways that might not have the content you're trying to test cached. Um, so, but yeah, the issue here is that in order for for us to like share a config with a service worker gateway, there's no there's no state that exists across all the isolated origins. So at the root origin where the service worker gateway is deployed, you can access access a configuration page which will store data in an index DB. Um, and then when you load a new subdomain or subdomain origin, the first time it loads that the redirect page and that config page in an iframe and then pass that config up to the service worker on uh, subsequent reloads of that subdomain worker it's no longer pulling in that iframe and rendering it and then doing the post message to post it <clears throat> to that subdomain service worker so if you update the global config that subdomain where the origin isolated service worker is running will not get those updates so do we have ideas on how to fix that or do we want to fix that or add some additional messages or like yeah and anything else you want to say there daniel i just wanted to kind of recap for the recording and any, anything else yeah um i i think there's like the slightly broader problem which is once we install the service worker and we're essentially trying to simulate a gateway, there's no way for really the user to do any customization. So, I mean, it is obviously related somehow to like how we do the message passing, but I think the broader problem is that once you've installed the service worker, like you don't have any sort of, we don't have any real easy mechanism to allow the user for customization. Unless, and I, I sort of suggested that, that we introduce like a magic path um, where it's like, oh, this magic path will work differently. It won't resolve it to whatever the SID, IPFS the SID's content is yeah. supposed to be. Yeah. It's like a magic path that if you load that, then the service worker will be smart enough to like return you something else, like a config page. Yeah. But then again, the problem with that is like, how do you let the user know that that exists? Yeah. Yeah. I, th I mean, I think we could do some education to the users <clears throat> from the config page and documentation for the Helio service worker gateway and things to, to make sure that exists. Um, but yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't really know of any other way where we could do this. Like, So this is somewhat also related to what Adin said, which was, I think at one point we discussed, oh, we shouldn't even block the user on the service worker installation page. We should just try to load it as soon as possible and, you know, auto reload by default. Um, and this is also somewhat related because one of the configs is auto reload and really auto reload is only relevant once. Um, well, it's, it's for all future subdomains. So if you enable yeah. auto reload yeah, yeah, yeah. and then you go to a new subdomain, yeah. when it loads that config page, it'll say, oh, auto reload set on the global config route. So I'm just going to refresh without staying here. Yep. Yeah, yeah. My point was more if we want to just remove that option and enable it by default, you don't need that option. And if you enable it by default, then 
you don't you lose also the opportunity to educate the user. You might have a short time span in which you're installing the gateway, but once you reload it, that's it. You lost that opportunity. Um, and given, you know, like just the UX of this for the user, it's not something that we can count on. So really like the only thing that sort of seems sensible and would love to hear what you think about it is just having this like special path and having that in the documentation. And it's like, okay, some people might, you know, be like, oh, what the fuck is going on? Um, and so they're going to have to find out that, oh, there's this magic path where they can go to and then config, say, a different trustless gateway. Are, are there any mechanisms to be able to send data from the from the root to the subdomains? Yeah. That, because that, that, that would be like, yeah, go ahead. But th that's what you Russell do... has already done, right? Well, well, yeah, I mean, the iframe post message, but is there a way without like rendering content? And I mean, we 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 could do a post to the service worker. Like if we allow uh, cores, like can we, can we, uh, there's probably something like, can we, can we send a request to the root service worker? Uh, I don't know if that would work. There's, there's probably something there. Cause what I'm thinking is like, you know, the, if we can make it work, I think the reasonable UX here would be like the first time you've loaded any of this stuff with the service worker gateway, maybe you get hit with the config page and a little bit of education, and then you can click OK and you go through. And then every other time it auto loads and that you can go to the root page and the root page will let you do the config. Because ultimately, I think right, even for like dweb.link and ipfs.io, we want to start making the root <laughs> the root pages like have meaningful information on them, right? And that that sounds like a, a sort of a reasonable pattern, or like learn more page, about my gateway. You could render, um, you could render maybe an iframe. I don't know, like you could render an iframe of the subdomain and then do some message passing there. Kind well, of not like of the, the inverse of what we do now. Well, not of the subdomain because you don't know the subdomain, right? If I just put an in browser dot link, I don't know what the sub thing is you're talking about. But I also think that having different configs per subdomain is probably ripe for user confusion more than anything else. Like, yeah. who is the power user that's like, ah, yes, <laughs> when I've every time I reload you know, Vitalik.eth, I want to use this DOH resolver, but every time I load, you know, uh, whatever, you know, IPFS.eth, I want a, funny. I want a, I want a different set of DOH resolvers. Like, like who is doing that? It feels like yeah. you just want one config for the whole application where application means the service worker gateway rooted at in browser.link. Sure. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Like, this is the ideal case. Like you reduce right. the overhead of like the user being aware of domain specific config. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it does yeah, I think so, so can you do like a corsi sort of thing where you allow the subdomains? I don't know if course is quite the right wording here, but allow the subdomains to like query the root domain for the config. For the config. Yeah. Yeah. It's something we, we should investigate. Um, Isn't that what the iframe mechanism was supposed to do? I, I'm kind of confused. Well, yeah, the just this bug though, like the config is if if you update the config, it's it's not adhered to for subsequent loads of that subdomain. So like if you if you load some subdomain um like Vitalik and then you realize like, oh, I actually know that um dweb.link um you know pins and always has this content cached so i definitely want to use that subdomain gateway or you know whatever other gateway and then you go and update the config and then reload that vitalik dot dot eth um it won't get those updated gateways yeah but that's just a matter of adding a, 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 having a path that's excluded from service worker 
on the on the root domain. Well, the, Oops. so this isn't the root domain. So this the summary of the problem. So like you load a subdomain URL. Let's let's do it right here. So we load the subdomain URL. It has our config. I'm gonna set like oh I know I have this content. Um, actually my my gateway is not running right now. Like I have this content, so I'm gonna set the routers and the gateways. I'm gonna save the config. Oh yay, fun. Um, yeah, I've got a. Uh, yeah, this is why we need to load the iframe with the origin so it can set the target, or else the iframe message passing security won't let it pass. But anyway, if this did succeed, um, and then I refresh the page or click load content, which just refreshes the page, it loads this service worker URL, and then if I go to in browser.link slash config. And then I update this to be, you know, oh, I actually, you know, did the wrong port. So I'm going to do 888. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then I save this config and then I reload this subdomain. It does not have this update. Because it cannot that... re read through the iframe mechanism anymore. Be because yeah, all of the queries going through this now are going through the service worker. So we need some way to read that config on non-first page requests for sub origin isolated uh, service workers. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 So like, can we can we do like a get request to you know the root domain slash config, and then that responds with JSON if it's like a post request or something, you know, and the service worker will just emit that config that it has in the index DB. Like, how do we actually get that root config? And... I don't think you can, I don't think you can do a cross origin sort of request, say from a subdomain to the root and it will go to the service worker. Like, is that actually possible? Yeah, I, 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 I'm not sure. Um, I'd have to test it. Like it. So the 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 mechanism for that we need is when you change a config on the root, we want to notify subdomains somehow uh, by other yeah. means than having to have an iframe and post message. So we can do that. We can set a, a flag, which is like a cookie flag, which says, "Hey." you need to reload. I like and it. Then, and then it will just do the thing it did originally. We don't need to introduce anything new. If that's, if that's, that's like one way. But that should be just a binary flag. We cannot pass config that way because it is bidirectional. Yeah. So who's actually setting this? So, so the root domain is setting this uh, cookie, and with cookies we can do cross subdomains, right? We can share yeah, a cookie can, across yeah, subdomains. Yeah, when you set the cookie, you are able to like say this cookie should also be visible for subdomains. And then what happens is that the service worker that is already installed, it has to check whether there's this cookie, because it's the one handling all of these requests. And so it checks if the cookie is there, and if it is, it triggers some reload and avoids loading stuff. Yeah, I, I guess like the like high gateway. level idea is that, that that's like a poison pill for a service worker yeah. to just remove itself, yeah. and then we and reload the page, and that then we just have a clean slate. Yeah. Yeah. That. The cookie that would definitely work. Um, yeah, I'm not sure on this one because the yeah, in so, practice the user would not like change config that often. It's not right a deal if we just reinitialize service worker once in a while. Uh, but it's also like how often people will do this. It's like it's useful to have and in general to be able to uh, just nuke the the service worker. Well, so you so okay, you said reinitialize the service worker every once in a while. Um 
what that what that means effectively is like unregistering the service worker, at, which would then cause that redirect page with iframe um, to show again. So do we have like a timeout like for a service worker to unregister itself and can? Uh, yeah, but, I mean, we can get it to unregister itself. But... Yeah, I think that's like a maybe like a casting discussion because also there's a separate issue about how do we manage uh, once we have like the basic correctness, how do we manage lifecycle of those service workers? Do we not uh, do do we like keep them uh, so the offline mode works better and then give people some means of reloading, or do we have a just also like a time based uh, expiration? Um, yeah, currently they're updating if there's an update. Yeah, yeah. I think like maybe like in general, I, I think this is like, it, 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 it's something we'll have to figure out, but I think the basic correctness and caching is more important than making sure the config is yeah. uh, propagated, right? Yeah, it was mostly, yeah, and it, it's mostly helping right now for, for me for testing. So I don't, I don't think this is priority right now but i think it's important for us to like discuss this for the future because like filebase or infura you know other other people will you know um daghouse or web3.storage like if they're if they're having people run their own like service worker gateways to load content like they'll want to advise people of what gateways to configure but then yeah it would mostly be on that first load, but um, yeah, we got some solutions to go forward with here. Is that, do you feel like our discussion is good enough for yeah. now, Daniel? Anything else to discuss? Let's move on. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, great, great call out, good find. Um, and we talked about the HTTP range headers bit. Um, yeah, there's some other stuff I could probably chat with you offline, Alex, just about the the Unix FS, um, um, like offset and length, um, not throwing errors if the range is out of bounds of the stream or the content and different, different things. But, and yeah, I need to double check again, why I imp implemented the circular buffer for the stream splicing. Um, yeah, I don't, I think we covered everything on here. Am I missing anything? I don't think so. Go back to the Epic. Yeah. Anything anybody else wants to discuss? Otherwise, I think we're good. Does anyone want to say guess... something cool? Yes. Yeah. You got a demo? Yeah, I've got a demo. Well, I've been running a demo the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> so people remember this. Uh, this is the the behavior of web transport sessions in Chrome. Um, so you can see it's all errors, and I've got I've got like no connections. I have three, you know, I have one web transport connection that's been running. This has been running for I don't know the last like 10, 15 minutes or whatever. Tell me um, this so is I've Firefox. Three nightly. Pairs. Sorry. Tell me we're so testing three, Firefox peers, nightly. Four peers, right? And I click go to run a to run a DHT query for a random piece of data. And you can see nothing, nothing. It's just errors. It's all errors. Like tedious. Okay. So this this time, but with Firefox. Is, this is Firefox nightly. So this is as of this morning or last night at some somewhere in the world. Wow. Um, so this has been this is running all time, right? So that you see all the open web, uh, web transport connections I have. They're all 50, right? So, uh, yeah, so I've got 49 web transport connections open. So look at all the peers that I've got. It's amazing. Um, and I can run, I run the same DHT query a random piece just looking for close appears to a random piece of data and i guess direct into all these things go back up to the graph look getting bigger i've got more I've got more connections this is amazing i've got 50 connections um and then if i look at the process manager 
That's thirty-five percent down to twelve percent CPU. I mean, it's not a lot, right? For a browser. That is amazing. Awesome. I love that so much. Here. I I wonder if a a useful thing for us to do uh doesn't have to be right you know immediate but um we should probably have a version of a dht client that just gets you like just gets you um a a relay v2 server basically right because like i don't expect i'm not expecting the browsers to be able to do dht queries reasonably but they should have but relay v2 can. servers they they they're using firefox they might they 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 might uh, especially as more of the network updates it it might coming. work um but they what they should certainly be able to do is hold open like three connections to peers that can serve as relay v2 so that they can be contacted um if you're trying to like you know, if you want for people who are trying to serve data, right? Or basically for the people who are trying to do WebRTC things, like for realsies, and they don't want to use the Google servers, they can use the Amino DHT to do the coordinating, to do the the whole punching business. Um and that's probably again, I don't think because we're more focused on downloading data into the browser than sending data from the browser right now, um, not so important, but I think that's like a just a, a, a sub DHT like a sub DHT client that just does the part of it that you need for having a relay seems like it would be useful. Mm. Just because it's like you're you're still leveraging the network, but because you don't need all of it, you don't need to have open very many connections. You just need like a few. Really cool. And also yeah, maybe it shows the Chromium people that like it is in fact doable. You you can in fact do the thing. And let's hope yes. it survives from nightly to beta. <laughs> yeah, that too. Also quickly little... quickly delete the video. We don't any want anyone to know it works before <laughs> they've shipped it. <laughs> um also the this issue about WebRTC data channel messages. <clears throat> Uh, because because we had, I was trying to you know talk to Marco about uh, web transport. This one, no, not that one. It was um, one about web transport closing streams and losing messages. And Marco just posted on the Chrome thing. This is the spec. The spec says you're wrong. Um, she's like, okay, cool. Uh, maybe I'll try doing that on this web RTC one. So I did. Uh, just like. Chrome's not compliant with the spec. Now suddenly there's some interest. And Chromium developers who are, they seem to be agreeing that this is in fact not what web RTC data channels should do. So, you know, hopefully we might even get reliable reliable web RTC soon as well. That's amazing. That's amazing. Right. Oh, 24 is Mar Marco back one day and already causing noise. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, uh, please, thank you, and are you spec compliant? <laughs> Turns out only one of those actually works. Are you spec compliant is the only one that actually works. Uh, good stuff. Yeah, oh, cool. Awesome, awesome demo. That's that's crazy exciting. Um, I gotta I gotta start using Firefox more. Uh, yeah. Thanks for that, Alex. Thanks for sharing. That's that's crazy exciting. We need to make some noise about that. Um, if if we can make positive noise, that will not make them take it away. <laughs> cool. Anything else we want to discuss here? Anybody else got anything cool to show? Cool, like Helio browser demos or like? Pretty sure even if someone had anything, it's a bad time because you cannot top that. 
<laughs> yeah. Save it, for, save it for next week. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah, we can save it for next week. Cool. Yeah, I think that's it. Um, thanks, guys. Thanks for joining. Thanks. Thanks for everything. See you guys next time.